Okay, this is a different paper, co-authored <laughs> with Charlie Brendan uh, from Cambridge. This is a, a normative paper that's about Kidland and Prescott problems. We're in a good audience here, so I'm sure we all know what Kidland and Prescott problems are. The sort of problems where expectations of what happens in the future is going to affect what you could do now in the current choice set. So these are environments where there's going to be benefits to making promises of what you're going to do in the future, and then there's going to be incentives to break those promises. As we're all aware, these are just about everywhere in macroeconomics. So whenever you're thinking about capital taxation, inflation bias stories, social insurance, they're all over the place. The purpose of this paper, then, is to identify and characterize a new class of desirable commitments in Kidland and Prescott problems. Now, the paper is written in a very general form, but to make it as accessible as possible, I'm going to work through specific examples, two specific examples in this talk to make it easier. Right, what do we do? Well, when we've read Kidland and Prescott, we know that in worlds where there is time and consistency, there is no policy that's recursively optimal. That's just a restatement of the time inconsistency problem. What is optimal <coughs> to commit to today won't be optimal when you move into the future. Now, how has the profession responded to that? Well, in many ways, but a lot of the work involves Ramsey policy. Now, Ramsey policy is imposing the preferences of the initial policymaker or the, the initial person at time zero. So the way that solved the first problem is to say, well, we can't have recursive optimality, therefore let's drop the recursivity and let's just focus on the optimality. We're not very happy with that because we think the recursivity of institutional design is really, really important. So we want to find some policy that's desirable and it will remain desirable in the future. So we want to retain the recursivity, but because it's a time and consistency problem, we know we're going to have to drop the idea of optimality being what we mean by desirable, and we're going to have a, a different, weaker concept of what desirability could mean. In particular, what I'm going to try and develop for you is the idea of using a Pareto criterion. So something is going to be efficient and it's going to remain efficient in the future. So we're going to apply this idea of Pareto efficiency, a Pareto criterion, across time. And because we're interested in time and consistency problems, that's going to be applied only to the choice of promises. I'm going to talk you through exactly how we do that. All along, what we're imagining here is that the policymaker has a commitment device. He can commit to things. And so it's an institutional design. Okay, why are we getting so excited about this? Well, our reading is there's quite a lot of discomfort in the literature about what Ramsey commitment policies look like. So it's just for, uh, for semantics, but is the uh, recursive Pareto efficiency same as the negotiation? I, 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 I don't want to answer that. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you exactly what recursive Pareto efficiency is, and then after we're doing that, I'll come back and we can talk about that. But if I try to, tr do, to do it now on the fly, it's not going to work. So, Ramsey policy has got features that somehow are unrealistic and implausible. Remember I said this was a, a normative paper. First up, Ramsey policy gives you substantial disparity between long and short run choices. I'm going to show you an example in a Newcastle framework, but I'm sure you're already very familiar with these classic Chamley Judd results on optimal capital taxation where you have very, very high initial taxes, but then you commit to zero long-run capital taxes. So there's a lot of asymmetry in what you do 
in the short and long run. A second feature that we think people consider rather implausible is those long-run outcomes may be undesirable per se. And what we have in mind here are all those Thomas and Worrell type immiseration results where a Ramsey policy commits you with probability one to immiserate a large proportion of the population. Now what I'm hoping is when I come up with my recursively desirable property, it's going to address both of those things. So let me, let me motivate how we came at this by a very simple example with a New Keynesian paper. So this is a textbook, New Keynesian inflation bias problem. You've got a policymaker whose losses are determined in terms of deviations of inflation from zero and deviations of output from a non-zero output target. But then they're subject to a Phillips curve constraint, and the Phillips curve constraint here is the standard New Keynesian Phillips curve. Inflation is a function of expected future inflation and then the output gap. Notice this is completely deterministic. We've got no state variables. It's a very simple example for the motivation. But we already have the time and consistency problem here because what you would like to do is commit to low future inflation. If you promise low future inflation, that means you can either have low inflation now for any given output gap, or alternatively, for the same inflation, you can actually stimulate output and get it closer to its target. But then when period t plus 1 comes along, you want to deviate and you want to renege on that commitment. Right, you could start off by here looking at the Markov perfect equilibrium, the discretionary equilibrium. Now, we know a lot about that. We know you end up with high inflation, it's the inflation bias, and so we know that it's possible to do better if you have access to a commitment technology. So Pareto improvement is possible here. And Pareto improvement here, I'm thinking of in terms of you can make every generation better off by making some commitment. And by generation here, I mean a policymaker sitting in period zero, looking from period zero into the infinite future. That would be generation zero. Generation one would be the policymaker sat in period one, looking into the infinite future, and so on. So we can make all those people better off because we've got access to a commitment technology. But the question you should then ask is, how should we allocate these Pareto gains? What does the Ramsey policy do? It allocates the Pareto gains such that the first generation zero gets the best possible outcome. So it makes the generation zero policymaker a dictator. That's what's going on in my first graph. So the, the green top line is what you get in the Markov perfect equilibrium. That's the inflation bias. And you get very high losses. But then if you allow for a commitment technology, you allow Ramsey policy period zero to make the commitment. Well, what they would actually do is they commit to a falling inflation. So they commit that inflation is high, but it's falling and then going down to zero in the future. Because falling inflation is stimulating your output in the new Keynesian Phillips curve, and, and you, you like that. So measuring now losses using those generation concepts, everybody does better off under here on the Ramsey policy. But this blue line is slightly turning downwards here because Generation zero is the one that's the most best off because it's the one who's actually set the Ramsey policy and made the commitment. Sorry, is this literally an overlapping generations model, or is this a? What, it's a, it's an infinite. Generation? So, how are you using the term generation? I'm using the generation. That, that's what I said. Generation zero is the is is referring to a policymaker 
sat in period zero looking to the infinite future. Generation one is sat in period one looking to the infinite but future. The agents do live forever. So the agents live forever. Yeah, the agent lives forever. But I'm this quite, is I'm gonna, policymaker welfare, not agent. Yeah. 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 Sense, yeah. Okay. Now, what's good about the Ramsey policy is, of course, it takes you to a dynamic Pareto frontier in period zero. In the sense that there's no alternative sequence of inflation and output that's going to make all the policymakers from this period onwards better off. That's trivial because it's been optimized from the point of view of the policymaker at time zero. We can't even make them better off by changing any policy. So the Ramsey policy puts you on the Pareto frontier. But having said that, there's lots of other policies that put you on the Pareto frontier. That's not the only one. Let's have a look at this simple policy problem, which would be to choose a constant inflation and a constant output gap to minimize losses subject to the new Keynesian Phillips curve. I can write that policy problem down. I'm just forcing my policymaker to have a constant inflation, constant output policy. That one's going to give you constant inflation, and it's going to give you actually constant losses. That one is also on the Pareto frontier. There's no better sequence that will make all policymakers better off than the one you've got. There's a sequence that will make the policymaker at time zero better off, that will be the Ramsey policy, but there's no policy that makes everybody better off. Right, I've got two policies now on the Pareto frontier. What I like about my second policy is it took me to the Pareto frontier and then the next period, I stayed on the Pareto frontier. Because it's a constant policy. If, it was a, if I was on the Pareto frontier in period zero, when I move forward one period, the world is exactly the same as it was in period zero, so I must be still on the Pareto frontier. So I stay on the Pareto frontier under this alternative policy. For Ramsey, that's not true. The Ramsey policy does not stay on the Pareto frontier after the first period has passed. We can see that very clearly here. Suppose we'd been following the Ramsey policy. So we've been following the falling inflation. We've got the low losses. But then eventually you come to a point where, get to say here or 20 periods on, when your losses continuing the Ramsey policy are actually worse than if you switch to my alternative constant inflation policy. So at that point, it's definitely gone off the Pareto frontier. It's actually gone off much, much earlier because as soon as what period passes, you're off the Pareto frontier. So that's why I'm going to sell a, a desirability of some policy that stays on the Pareto frontier. Yeah? Is there a connection between this and that timeless perspective stuff? Well, the timeless perspective is very simple. The timeless perspective is it's the long run of the Ramsey policy, which is definitely not on the Pareto frontier. Yeah? When you say the place of Pareto frontier, yeah. is tracing out the frontier uh, is more fit to put in additional weights than beta on different generations? I'm going to come to that. And the answer is, is no. But I'll, tell you, I'll, I will, I'll flag that one up exactly where I go. I'm only one, one or two slides. Right. I think it's next but one. So I want you to take three things away from this. One is the Ramsey policy is on the Pareto frontier initially, but the continuation policy is not. The second is there exist policies that stay on the Pareto frontier indefinitely. And I've shown you one that's very simple dynamics. It was just constant inflation and output. So those are the three observations I want to motivate me. And my paper is now going to think about 
three, three questions. First, can I generalize this? Can I generalize the idea of recursive Pareto efficiency? If I do generalize it, do I get something different from Ramsey? And then, third question is, if I generalize it, can I find a simple way of representing what that generalization generalizes? Okay, this is coming to your second question, not the renegotiation proof. So how am I going to generalize? It's not as easy as you may seem, because I want to generalize it to a world with endogenous states. And when you've got endogenous state variables, you get two allocative questions. First of all, the one I've been talking about now, how do you distribute the Pareto gains from being able to make commitment? But secondly, you get the standard problem of when you have state variables, that how you distribute resources over time. So there's conflict about what capital stock you leave for future generations, but there's also conflict about what promises you leave, what, what commitments you make for future generations. And a key difficulty we've had, we think we've cracked it now, is how to separate these. Now, coming back to the question here, if you think of changing the discount factor, so you have a social discount factor. So I wasn't thinking about Paribas, I was thinking about the paper by Aldo and Chris Payton, where they, so Paribas is a very uh, particular restriction that the, the, the discount factors have to be only a function of time. Yeah. In principle, the additional discount factors could be a function of whatever object you want. It could be a function of the state, it could be a function of the shops. So that's the, the direction which Aldo and Chris... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to put that one for coffee. But what, what, I, what I will need to do what it, wherever we are is I need to separate out these two issues. Because I want to talk about time and consistency. I don't want to talk about distribution of resources over time. So the Farring and Burning and various other people who play around with social discount rates, that can solve, of course, it'll address the, the issue of the Pareto gains, but it'll also impact on here. So I can't just play around with discount factors. And I need some new and adapted apparatus. So here's an overview of what we generally do, and then we'll switch to another example where I show you exactly what we're doing. So I need to think about this Pareto efficiency, and I'm going to do it in terms of these promise sequences. You'll have seen things like this when you're used to seeing promise values in Abra, Pierce, and Stichetti type uh, environments, but I'm going to view the whole vector, the whole sequence of promises going from the period now into the infinite future. That's going to play a role in what I'm doing. And the reason I'm doing this is to make that distinction that I told you between the, the time consistency elements of the problem and the standard intergenerational fairness type of uh, question. And my idea of Pareto efficiency is then going to be, it's a set of promises that will, if it's Pareto efficient, there's not going to be an alternative set of promises that such that all policymakers in future periods prefer that set of promises. That's going to be a Pareto efficient set of promises. A recursively Pareto efficient set of promises is going to be Pareto efficient even if time passes and therefore the policymaker at time zero is no longer relevant for the discussion of Pareto efficiency. So this comes back to your very first question of renegotiation proof. It's a kind of renegotiation proofness where somebody has dropped out of the negotiations because they died. Okay. So I want to talk this through in a, a second example because I need an example here with state variables. So I'm going to talk about the Judd problem. 
very simple. Workers supply labor inelastically, and they receive their wage income, which they are then uh, get some consumption. It's the capitalists who own the capital stock, but don't work. The government, it needs to raise money for government spending, and it raises it through linear taxes on capital and wages, and runs a balanced budget every year. So we need sufficient tax income to pay a fixed government expenditure G. And then the government is going to be concerned about the welfare of people in the economy, but it's going to give a weight muse to the capitalists. Right, we're going to jump very, very quickly, but we have such a good audience, we can do that. I'm going to jump to presenting the problem in primal form. So what I've done is you can think of setting it in the, the normal form, and then you solve out for the wages using the, the government budget constraint and so on. So in primal form, we're down to choosing a, an allocation for consumption of workers and capitalists and capital accumulation that maximizes present discounted value of the welfare of workers and the capitalists with the, the, the particular weight, subject to a resource constraint, which is very standard, and then subject to the implementability condition. Now, the implementability condition has come from the forward-looking oil of equation for consumption once you've subbed out for, for prices. So, those who are slightly less familiar, all you need to know is a solution to this problem will be able to be implemented by a set of linear capital and labor taxes, which are time-varying but linear in each period. There's time inconsistency in there because of this constraint here. What you want to do is, if capital is high, you want to promise that you will get a lot out of saving capital in the future, but then when the capital is coming in the future, you'll have an incentive to decode to, to defend. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split up that implementability constraint using this promise value mechanism. And the aim here is to get the time and consistency problem separated out from the standard capital accumulation problem. So if we think in promise value terms, there's two promises at time t that I need to think about. There's the promise that's going to be made for the next period. Now, there's a restriction on that, because you can't just promise whatever. You have to make promises that are consistent with the implementability constraint. So there's going to be a promise constraint about the promises you made. And then there's going to be a promise constraint about the promises you keep. If you put those two promise keeping and promise making constraints together in rational expectations equilibrium, you get back to the implementability constraint. Okay, now we're going to start doing a little bit of this new apparatus. So I'm going to talk about an inner problem. And the inner problem is, let's take the promises you need to make as given. So they're exogenous. Promises you need to make and keep, you are given exogenous. So this thing is given. I can then define an inner problem which says, what's the maximum value of the weighted average utility of workers and capitalists such that I satisfy the resources constraint, such that I satisfy the promise-keeping constraint, so I keep exactly those exogenous promises that I've, I've taken as given, and I make those promises that were exogenously given. So you might think of this as a type of day-to-day -day policy making, that given I have to have some promises about promise values, how am I going to organize the allocation to satisfy those? And I'm going to call that V function. 
That says the present discounted value of utility, weighted utility, when these are the promises I need to make and I need to keep. <coughs> So yeah. There is like a big case market trick here, right? So, Sorry. so the, when they when they take this as given, yeah. the, 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 the law of motion for them is also taken as exogenous. Um, yes, they take they're taking the whole vector of promises here as given. So it's like a bunch of numbers. Yeah, it's just a string of numbers that is the promise values they have to deliver upon. But then there's no trick involved here. Because should I optimize the promise sequence, I can get back to Ramsey. So all I'm doing is I'm separating out the problem. So I'm thinking of the first order conditions once you've already set the promises. Yeah, but somehow you want to come back and at the second step you're going to... Yeah, no, outer problem. This is inner problem. Outer problem is going to be about choosing the promise sequence. Okay. Now, why have I done that? I've done that because it's quite nice that this inner problem is actually time consistent. So I can write it in a standard Bellman equation form. Now, we have the, the proof that that's true. But intuitively, that makes a lot of sense because all the promises are where all the time inconsistency is about. The time is about what promise you want to make, what promise you want to renege on, what promise you want to honor. That's all taken as exogenous. So given that exogeneity, this part of the problem is time consistent. And that works very well. This is, turns out to be a, a useful object, as you can see. OK, let's now go to the, the outer problem, which is choosing these promises, these sequences of promises um, in the institutional design problem. So just to make this very clear what you've understood. So suppose you chose the set of the sequence of promises going forward that would maximize the value of those promises from the perspective of the policymaker in period zero, you would get a set, a sequence of promise values. We could call this the Ramsey set of promise values. Were we to move forward one period, the capital stock will have moved. If we were to re-optimize the promise sequence, we would want to have something different than the continuation of the promise sequence that we had in the first period. That was all very complicated, but it's just a restatement of time and consistency problem all over again. Could we just see the previous slide for one second? Could we see one more previous slide? <laughs> okay. This this is a this is a Noah Williams time scale question of what a second is when uh, you want to see. Okay. So we've got an allocation problem here with different preferences. The policymaker at time zero has different preferences over these promises than the policymaker at time one. Now, how do you resolve that? Well, one thing you could do is you just appoint a dictator. That's what the Ramsey policy does. The Ramsey policy says this guy is a dictator. We optimize the promise sequence that is the best for the policymaker at time zero. But you don't have to do that. Instead, if you've got an allocation problem, you could look at what it would mean for Pareto efficient outcomes more generally. So, looking at Pareto efficiency is going to mo motivate a definition of what Pareto efficiency could mean. When I'm talking about promises, so I'm just talking about the promise sequence being Pareto efficient. And I'm going to say that something is Pareto efficient if I cannot find an alternative set of promises. That's my alternative relative to the one I'm considering. Such that every generation of policymakers 
becomes better off under the alternative set of promises. That's my definition of Pareto efficiency. This is the one we've come up with ourselves. There are many, many different ones you could think of. But this is the one we're going to run with. Two things I want to highlight about that is it's all along the same capital stock path. And two is I've got this little epsilon, which is a scalar. Is it that every policymaker has to be better off or just one? Sorry? Just one policymaker would have to be better off? So it's Pareto efficient means that we cannot find an alternative such that everybody is made better off. So you might be able to make part of the weaker than that. Yeah, no, so I mean you might, but this this is my okay. my definition. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Based on the, the, the yes, and that's that's what I'm just going to tell you about. So, so first of all, this is responding to to Jim. This is strict gains. So we're doing this for two reasons. One is it just gives us a big set of policies, but if we go for weak, that's going to be a, a, a more restricted set of policies. Actually, it's more a question of um, limit results and making sure that things stop. The other thing which has come up here is, this is an on-path definition. It's about promises only. So this is not people saying, I would prefer a different set of promises because under those different set of promises, I would be left with a different capital stock when I come in. Now, we can argue about that a long time. We're doing it this way because it works. It works recursively, and it separates out those ideas of dividing up the Pareto improvements from the standard capital accumulation. That's why, you know why it's done. Okay. We've defined what Pareto efficiency means. My definition two is recursive Pareto efficiency. So I can't find an alternative set of promises that everybody prefers at time zero, but then at time one, I still can't find an alternative set of promises that people prefer. That time two, I can't find. And so that's what recursive Pareto efficiency will be. I, re I remain on the Pareto frontier. Right, two results. One is we can find them. There are, that was upside down, so I think that says nine minutes. <laughs> we can find them. These policies do exist, like the one I showed you in the motivating example of the constant inflation. That was one of these. So they exist. Result two, when they exist, they converge to a steady state that's different to the Ramsey policy, and we have a proof of that. That's also saying the same as the Ramsey steady state is not Pareto efficient. So. Okay, back to the example for the last few minutes. Remember, this is the capital accumulation with um, capitalists and workers. So, in terms of a cookbook, what we need to do, we solve the inner problem for given omegas. So, for a given promise sequence, we know what the inner problem is going to be. That will typically give you a set of first order conditions in the multipliers on the promise keeping and the promise making constraint. Remember, they, those are treated as exogenous at that point. Then we choose the set of promises, the sequence of promises that are consistent with recursive Pareto efficiency. Typically, that's some restriction on the multipliers. It's actually a very interesting restriction. It's typically one about how you weigh up the costs and benefits of making promises. And the costs and benefits, the way you Weigh up the costs and benefits of making promises will typically be different from what you do in Ramsey. That's because under Ramsey, you kind of know you make a promise, you get the benefit now, and you pay the cost in the future. So there's a discounting. That drops out. Under that. Now that gets us quite a long way. We then have to do a little bit more to pick down exactly uniqueness of this recursive Pareto efficiency. 
I'm not going to talk very much about it, but we're going to put two things there that actually well, one is redundant. But one's going to be an idea that suppose you start at the steady state, you will stay at the steady state. It doesn't happen under Ramsey policy. Two is going to be a, an orthogonality condition which is very natural to impose and gives you simple solutions. Remember right at the beginning I said I wanted simple implementability um, uh, representations. Okay, so back to the example. What does this recursive Pareto efficient policy look like? Well, it's got positive capital taxes in steady state. That's a big result. Also, when you think about the transition, we have a very beautiful, very naturally interpretable condition of what goes on in the transition. So this is if capital is away from steady state. And it's all about trading off a capital wedge and a consumption wedge. Because think about this. Suppose you're short of capital. So you think we need to accumulate capital. Well, to do that, you've got to give extra money to the capitalists. That's how you get them to save. But if you give extra money to the capitalists, part of that, they're just going to consume. So you need, you, when you're thinking about accumulating capital at the transition path, you need to trade off the idea of giving people more resources so that they accumulate capital more, with the fact that when you give the capitalists more money, their consumption increases, and in a Pareto sense, that's bad because you're trying to do the weighted average of the two. So you get a very nice in interpretable result. Here's what it actually looks like then in a calibrated model. This tells you what happens to the capital stock. Perfect. So if you're at the steady state, you stay at the steady state. Seems pretty reasonable. If you are below the steady state, so you're a bit short of capital, you will converge gradually <coughs> back to the steady state. And if you're above, you will converge down. Now the tax rates that underpin that are in this graph, so we get a steady state tax rate on capital of about 51% in a simple calibrated example. But then what happens, if you're short of capital, you cut the taxes on capital. So the capital taxes goes to like 45%. So you do that because you want to encourage the capitalists to accumulate capital. But there'll be a break on that because you don't want to give the capitalists too much money because they just go ahead and spend it. They don't use it for capital accumulation. The green line is the opposite way around. If you're rich in capital, then you put the capital uh, taxes up. Okay, very last slide. What we like about this is both of the models I've written down are very, very simple. The New Keynesian model, the capital tax accumulation model. What we like is we've got simple policies coming out of there that are satisfying some criteria that is desirable. In our case, this uh, efficiency. We've, we've got a series of papers going on about this, and in a marketing sense, I'm going to do this. What we think is, by applying this idea of recursive Pareto efficiency, we'll be able to address problematic Ramsey problems in a host of different environments. We're aware that many people have addressed the zero capital tax problem in different ways, but they all seem a little bit ad hoc and they're particularly tuned to that capital accumulation example, whereas we are taking things which we hope is going to be useful in other places. So if anybody knows these Koshula Cotta models about limited commitment, there there's a, this problem that the effective Pareto weights are non-stationary as time goes by. So you end up that the distribution of resources is dominated by randomness rather than the original Pareto weights. What we get if you apply our problem is you get mean reversion in these effective Pareto weights. So you get much nicer um, long-run properties. Similarly, in the immiseration literature, we don't get the immiseration of those. Ongoing work, maybe our, my discussion will, will, will pick up on some of this, I don't know. We have a very nice way to think about this in a wall-raising decentralization sense, but I, I, I won't bring 
Okay, thank you.